An important question about education is, then, why do some types of students achieve success easily and others struggle to do well? Well, one theory is that there is a genetic reason for academic achievement. What I mean by that is, a certain innate, measurable level of intelligence. Another frequently discussed theory is environmental factors, such as the effect of home and family upbringing. A final reason is related to the teaching and learning process within educational institutions, and the way it is organized, administered and assessed. An important question about education is, then, why do some types of students achieve success easily and others struggle to do well? Well, one theory is that there is a genetic reason for academic achievement. What I mean by that is, a certain innate, measurable level of intelligence. Another frequently discussed theory is environmental factors, such as the effect of home and family upbringing. A final reason is related to the teaching and learning process within educational institutions, and the way it is organized, administered and assessed. Barred owls can be found in dense forests right across North America. They feed on small mammals, fish, birds, and small reptiles, pretty much anything that comes their way. The barred owl grows up to half a meter tall and has emerged as a very adaptable nocturnal predator. Whereas they've been long thought to live in old-growth forests, they're now building up quite an urban population. In Charlotte, North Carolina, barred owls tend to nest in the cavities of the numerous willow oak trees that line the city streets. Far from being endangered, the owls have expanded their range, and now, in some places, conservationists are worried about the effects they might have on other native species. Barred owls can be found in dense forests right across North America. They feed on small mammals, fish, birds, and small reptiles, pretty much anything that comes their way. The barred owl grows up to half a meter tall and has emerged as a very adaptable nocturnal predator. Whereas they've been long thought to live in old-growth forests, they're now building up quite an urban population. In Charlotte, North Carolina, barred owls tend to nest in the cavities of the numerous willow oak trees that line the city streets. Far from being endangered, the owls have expanded their range, and now, in some places, conservationists are worried about the effects they might have on other native species. Before the beginning of the 1900s, the only way to obtain pearls was by collecting very large numbers of pearl oysters from the ocean floor by hand. The oysters, or sometimes mussels, were brought to the surface, opened and searched. More than a ton of these had to be checked in order to find just three or four quality pearls. Divers often descended to depths of over 100 feet on just one single breath. Now, of course, this exposed them to hostile creatures and dangerous waves, not to mention drowning. In some areas, divers put grease on their bodies to conserve heat, and they held a large object, like a rock, to descend, so they didn't have to exert effort going down. Today, pearl diving has pretty much been supplanted by cultured pearl farms. Particles are implanted in the oyster to encourage the formation of pearls, and this allows for more predictable production. The divers who still work do so mainly for the tourist industry. Before the beginning of the 1900s, the only way to obtain pearls was by collecting very large numbers of pearl oysters from the ocean floor by hand. The oysters, or sometimes mussels, were brought to the surface, opened and searched. More than a ton of these had to be checked in order to find just three or four quality pearls. Divers often descended to depths of over 100 feet on just one single breath. Now, of course, this exposed them to hostile creatures and dangerous waves, not to mention drowning. In some areas, divers put grease on their bodies to conserve heat, and they held a large object, like a rock, to descend, so they didn't have to exert effort going down. Today, pearl diving has pretty much been supplanted by cultured pearl farms. Particles are implanted in the oyster to encourage the formation of pearls, and this allows for more predictable production. The divers who still work do so mainly for the tourist industry. Almost everyone has heard of the London Stock Exchange, but relatively few know anything about the London Metal and Commodity Exchanges. Yet these markets have a greater influence on world economies because they set global prices for some of the essential raw materials for industry and food manufacture. The LME provides three basic services to the world's non-ferrous metal trade. First, it is a market where large or small quantities of metal of a guaranteed minimum standard can be bought and sold on specific trading days. Second, it acts as a barometer of world metal prices. And third, it is a hedging medium, 
That is, it can help traders get some protection from price fluctuations that occur for economic, political, or financial reasons. Almost everyone has heard of the London Stock Exchange, but relatively few know anything about the London Metal and Commodity Exchanges. Yet these markets have a greater influence on world economies because they set global prices for some of the essential raw materials for industry and food manufacture. The LME provides three basic services to the world's non-ferrous metal trade. First, it is a market where large or small quantities of metal of a guaranteed minimum standard can be bought and sold on specific trading days. Second, it acts as a barometer of world metal prices. And third, it is a hedging medium. That is, it can help traders get some protection from price fluctuations that occur for economic, political, or financial reasons. I'd recommend that you all try to get hold of English in the Southern Hemisphere by Nolan and Watts, as this provides an excellent overview of the topics that we're going to be covering in this module. It's really our primary text. It has particularly strong sections on the history of English in Australia and New Zealand, examining in some depth how the language has developed in these countries. The sections on phonology and on vocabulary will be invaluable when you're doing the written assignment, which I'm going to be telling you about in a moment once I've given you the details of a couple of other essential references. I'd recommend that you all try to get hold of English in the Southern Hemisphere by Nolan and Watts, as this provides an excellent overview of the topics that we're going to be covering in this module. It's really our primary text. It has particularly strong sections on the history of English in Australia and New Zealand, examining in some depth how the language has developed in these countries. The sections on phonology and on vocabulary will be invaluable when you're doing the written assignment, which I'm going to be telling you about in a moment once I've given you the details of a couple of other essential references. Learning a language in the classroom is never easy, and quite frankly, it's not the way that most people would choose to learn if they had other options. Having said that, there are plenty of reasons for keeping languages on the school curriculum. For one thing, a fair number of students go on to take jobs in business and commerce that require a basic knowledge of a second language. When you talk to young employees in top companies, it seems that they had a career plan from the start. They were motivated to find additional things to put on their CVs, and of course, language is one of those added but significant extras. Learning a language in the classroom is never easy, and quite frankly, it's not the way that most people would choose to learn if they had other options. Having said that, there are plenty of reasons for keeping languages on the school curriculum. For one thing, a fair number of students go on to take jobs in business and commerce that require a basic knowledge of a second language. When you talk to young employees in top companies, it seems that they had a career plan from the start. They were motivated to find additional things to put on their CVs, and of course, language is one of those added but significant extras. The assignment that I'm going to set for the holiday period is one that we've given students for a number of years. It's quite practical, and will allow you to get out and about. It's no good being shut up in your rooms all the time. It does have a written element too. Um, basically. It's our data gathering exercise, and there are two choices with regard to how you collect the data. We'll go through those in a moment. I'm also going to give you a link to an internet site that is, well, it's critical that you review this before you do anything, as it provides a lot of guidance on data presentation, both in terms of how you plot it, its diagrammatic form, and also its description. Which has to be clear. The assignment that I'm going to set for the holiday period is one that we've given students for a number of years. It's quite practical and will allow you to get out and about. It's no good being shut up in your rooms all the time. It does have a written element too. Um, basically, it's our data gathering exercise. And there are two choices with regard to how you collect the data. We'll go through those in a moment. I'm also going to give you a link to an internet site that is, well, it's critical that you review this before you do anything, 
as it provides a lot of guidance on data presentation, both in terms of how you plot it, its diagrammatic form, and also its description, which has to be clear. This week, we're going to be continuing our discussion of women in society. Last week, we looked at a number of issues relating to women in education. If you remember, we discussed women both at school and at university. Today, we're going to be considering the roles that women play in the workplace. Again, we'll start by taking a historical perspective, and inevitably you'll find that many of the same events that impacted on women in education also had a major influence on their working lives. In the second half of the lecture, I'll concentrate on the situation in Europe today, and I'll invite you to suggest how you think things are likely to develop over the next decade. Okay, so let's get started. This week, we're going to be continuing our discussion of women in society. Last week, we looked at a number of issues relating to women in education. If you remember, we discussed women both at school and at university. Today, we're going to be considering the roles that women play in the workplace. Again, we'll start by taking a historical perspective, and inevitably you'll find that many of the same events that impacted on women in education also had a major influence on their working lives. In the second half of the lecture, I'll concentrate on the situation in Europe today, and I'll invite you to suggest how you think things are likely to develop over the next decade. Okay, so let's get started. To be honest, the biggest problem for most undergraduate students in terms of academic writing is not only adapting to a far more structured and formal style, but also learning how to ascertain the difference between important, valid information and unnecessary or even irrelevant material. In my experience, I would say it takes students their first year, if not longer, to appreciate what is required and to start to implement those requirements in their writing. What they really should be doing, if they are struggling with written assignments, is to seek help from the excellent support services which are available at the university. To be honest, the biggest problem for most undergraduate students in terms of academic writing is not only adapting to a far more structured and formal style, but also learning how to ascertain the difference between important, valid information and unnecessary or even irrelevant material. In my experience, I would say it takes students their first year, if not longer, to appreciate what is required and to start to implement those requirements in their writing. What they really should be doing, if they are struggling with written assignments, is to seek help from the excellent support services which are available at the university. We hope to have something meaningful to say in our next book about the efficacy of advertising. This is a huge question that impacts everything from commerce to politics to journalism. But for now, let me give one example. My kids were recently watching a Yankees Red Sox Day game on TV, broadcast on the YES network. One of the commercials was an anti smoking ad, placed, I believe, by the city of New York. It was a gritty documentary style spot, featuring a surgeon talking to the camera, then showing the patient he was about to operate on. The patient was a man whose toes were blackened and rotting away. The image of the foot was extremely disgusting. It's gangrene, the surgeon said. And then he drew on the man's leg with a marker to show where he was about to take his hacksaw and cut off the leg. The ad made a huge impression on my five year old daughter. Hours later, she asked out of the blue, Are you still thinking about that boy's foot? She couldn't eat dinner that night since she was still thinking about the disgusting image. She's definitely more scared of seeing that foot again than she is of seeing the Wicked Witch of the West again. We talked about it for quite a while. I explained that smoking is bad for you, even though in the old days people actually thought smoking was good for you. And now the message they're sending is that nobody should smoke. Will this ad work? Will it cause a young person who sees it to never smoke cigarettes? Also, is this kind of imagery appropriate for broadcast during a program? A daytime baseball game that young kids will be watching?
We hope to have something meaningful to say in our next book about the efficacy of advertising. This is a huge question that impacts everything from commerce to politics to journalism. But for now, let me give one example. My kids were recently watching a Yankees Red Sox Day game on TV, broadcast on the YES network. One of the commercials was an anti smoking ad, placed, I believe, by the city of New York. It was a gritty documentary style spot, featuring a surgeon talking to the camera, then showing the patient he was about to operate on. The patient was a man whose toes were blackened and rotting away. The image of the foot was extremely disgusting. It's gangrene, the surgeon said. And then he drew on the man's leg with a marker to show where he was about to take his hacksaw and cut off the leg. The ad made a huge impression on my five year old daughter. Hours later, she asked out of the blue, Are you still thinking about that boy's foot? She couldn't eat dinner that night since she was still thinking about the disgusting image. She's definitely more scared of seeing that foot again than she is of seeing the Wicked Witch of the West again. We talked about it for quite a while. I explained that smoking is bad for you, even though in the old days people actually thought smoking was good for you. And now the message they're sending is that nobody should smoke. Will this ad work? Will it cause a young person who sees it to never smoke cigarettes? Also, is this kind of imagery appropriate for broadcast during a program? A daytime baseball game that young kids will be watching? The loss of construction jobs by immigrants from Latin America contributed to a spike in unemployment among all Latino workers to 6.5%, compared with 4.7% unemployed for non Latino workers, the report found. As recently as late 2006, Latino workers had achieved their historic low unemployment rate of 4.9%, based mainly on a job boom among immigrants, the report said. To put it bluntly, Hispanics had a rough time in the labor market in 2007, said Rakesh Kochar, the author of the report, who is associate director for research at the Pew Center, a nonpartisan organization in Washington. Job loss was particularly severe for Mexican immigrants, whose unemployment rate rose to 8.4%, from 5.5% in 2007, the report found. Of the 247,000 jobs lost by Latino workers in the construction industry in 2007, workers born in Mexico lost 152,000 jobs, or about 60%. Latino workers make up about 14% of the United States labor force, and about 52% of them are immigrants. The Pew Report, which is based on recent data from the Census and the Bureau of Labor Statistics, does not distinguish between legal and illegal immigrants. The banking credit crisis and a drop in home prices led to an abrupt slowdown in new home building last year. Illegal immigrant workers have been concentrated in construction, accounting for 12% of employment in that industry, according to a Pew study in 2006. Mexicans account for about 55% of more than 11 million illegal immigrants in the United States, the Pew Center has estimated. The loss of construction jobs by immigrants from Latin America contributed to a spike in unemployment among all Latino workers to 6.5%, compared with 4.7% unemployed for non Latino workers, the report found. As recently as late 2006, Latino workers had achieved their historic low unemployment rate of 4.9%. Based mainly on a job boom among immigrants, the report said. To put it bluntly, Hispanics had a rough time in the labor market in 2007, said Rakesh Kochar, the author of the report, who is associate director for research at the Pew Center, a nonpartisan organization in Washington. Job loss was particularly severe for Mexican immigrants, whose unemployment rate rose to 8.4%. 
from 5.5% in 2007, the report found. Of the 247,000 jobs lost by Latino workers in the construction industry in 2007, workers born in Mexico lost 152,000 jobs, or about 60%. Latino workers make up about 14% of the United States labor force, and about 52% of them are immigrants. The Pew Report, which is based on recent data from the Census and the Bureau of Labor Statistics, does not distinguish between legal and illegal immigrants. The banking credit crisis and a drop in home prices led to an abrupt slowdown in new home building last year. Illegal immigrant workers have been concentrated in construction, accounting for 12% of employment in that industry, according to a Pew study in 2006. Mexicans account for about 55% of more than 11 million illegal immigrants in the United States, the Pew Center has estimated. It isn't necessary to have a specialized knowledge of, say, the intricacies of counterpoint. Or even to be able to read music to understand it. Usually, getting the point of a piece of music, its emotional and dramatic impact, is immediate or simply requires you to become more familiar with it. Of course, prolonged study of music and its composition, as in any other field, will increase your understanding, but not necessarily your enjoyment. Now, I realize that it can require a good deal of willingness on our part to risk new sensations, and there is a lot of music that will seem unfamiliar and alien to you on a first hearing. It isn't necessary to have a specialized knowledge of, say, the intricacies of counterpoint, or even to be able to read music to understand it. Usually, getting the point of a piece of music, its emotional and dramatic impact, is immediate or simply requires you to become more familiar with it. Of course, prolonged study of music and its composition, as in any other field, will increase your understanding, but not necessarily your enjoyment. Now, I realize that it can require a good deal of willingness on our part to risk new sensations. And there is a lot of music that will seem unfamiliar and alien to you on a first hearing. Before farming was introduced into Scotland, people lived by hunting, fishing, and gathering wild foodstuffs. This way of life meant that they usually didn't settle permanently in one place, but were to an extent nomadic, moving about in search of a livelihood, perhaps returning to the same places at certain times of the year. It is believed that the islands of Orkney were known to these people, but so far only a few flint tools have been found to verify this. This is because coastal erosion has destroyed many ancient sites, and these may have contained relics of some of these earliest pioneering colonists. Before farming was introduced into Scotland, People lived by hunting, fishing, and gathering wild foodstuffs. This way of life meant that they usually didn't settle permanently in one place, but were to an extent nomadic, moving about in search of a livelihood, perhaps returning to the same places at certain times of the year. It is believed that the islands of Orkney were known to these people, but so far only a few flint tools have been found to verify this. This is because coastal erosion has destroyed many ancient sites, and these may have contained relics of some of these earliest pioneering colonists. Paper was first manufactured in Europe by the Spanish in the 12th century, although it had been imported since the 10th century. Around the year 1276, a mill was established at Fabriano in Italy. The town became a major centre for paper making, and throughout the 14th century provided most of Europe with fine quality paper, which it has continued to produce ever since. By the 15th century, paper was also being manufactured in Germany and France, and it was not long before both countries became almost completely independent of material bought overseas. With the increasing availability of paper in Europe, the production of identical printed pictures became almost inevitable.
Paper was first manufactured in Europe by the Spanish in the 12th century, although it had been imported since the 10th century. Around the year 1276, a mill was established at Fabriano in Italy. The town became a major centre for paper making, and throughout the 14th century provided most of Europe with fine quality paper, which it has continued to produce ever since. By the 15th century, paper was also being manufactured in Germany and France, and it was not long before both countries became almost completely independent of material bought overseas. With the increasing availability of paper in Europe, the production of identical printed pictures became almost inevitable. The spinal cord, the link between the brain and the body, is a band of nervous tissue about the thickness of your little finger that runs through the backbone. Nerve cells, called motor neurons, convey electric impulses that travel from the brain to the spinal cord, branching off at the appropriate point and passing to the various parts of the body. Similarly, sensory neurons transmit messages from organs and tissues via the spinal cord to the brain. But the spinal cord also functions without the brain having to intervene. It alone controls those actions called spinal reflexes that need to be carried out very fast in response to danger. The spinal cord, the link between the brain and the body, is a band of nervous tissue about the thickness of your little finger that runs through the backbone. Nerve cells, called motor neurons, convey electric impulses that travel from the brain to the spinal cord, branching off at the appropriate point and passing to the various parts of the body. Similarly, Sensory neurons transmit messages from organs and tissues via the spinal cord to the brain. But the spinal cord also functions without the brain having to intervene. It alone controls those actions called spinal reflexes that need to be carried out very fast in response to danger.